Cognitive Experience and Its Object by B. H. Bode. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cognitive Experience and Its Object by B. H. Bode. In a recent issue of this journal, footnote, volume 2, number 15, pages 393 to 399, end footnote, Professor Dewey contributes an interesting discussion of the postulate which forms the basis of immediate empiricism. According to his presentation, this postulate amounts to the statement that things are what they are experienced to be. One experience must be held to be as real, as ultimate, as any other, and so the usual distinction between appearance and reality is necessarily wrong in principle. That is to say, the standard according to which we condemn certain experiences as erroneous, while others are judged to be true, is not some fact external to the experience itself to which the experience in question either does or does not manage to conform but resides within the experience itself. This seems to mean that if the experience by inner motivation points to some further experience in which the prior experience fulfills itself, then this later experience is true to the extent to which the transition to the later experience takes place without any fundamental change in the quality or characteristic which continuously fulfills the corresponding quality present in the initial stage. Truth, then, is simply a relation which obtains among experiences that are equally real, and does not imply that certain experiences are simply appearances, in contrast to others which are not. That this postulate is actually involved in immediate empiricism appears to be beyond rational dispute. All experiences are equally real. At this point, however, Professor Woodbridge raises the doubt whether immediate empiricism has been sufficiently mindful of the unique character of those experiences which are commonly called cognitive. Footnote. This journal, volume 2, number 21, pages 573 to 576. End footnote. He expresses the fear that in their zeal to avoid the postulate of idealism, the pragmatists have gone to the opposite extreme and tend to dispose of all facts as experiences without much regard to the difference between the cognitive and the non-cognitive. The point involved becomes apparent when, having accepted the empiricist definition of reality, we take up the fruitful and important question, what is the nature of the real? When is it most fittingly and appropriately defined? Page 573. For in the face of this question, another inevitably suggests itself. If reality as true is but one sort of reality or one sort of experience, how can it possibly be affirmed that the nature of reality is most fittingly defined when reality is experienced as true? Page 514. All experiences, as has been said, are equally real. And, moreover, they alone are real. Yet this discovery does not absolve us from the obligation to answer the question, in what sort of experience do I find out what any sort of experience is, and is actually or otherwise? Page 575. And the answer to this question it has held necessitates the conclusion that the whole knowing experience is a transcendent kind of experience, related to all other kinds in a way in which they are not related to it. Page 574. That is to say, in the cognitive experience all other sorts of experience may exist without alteration, or, in the cognitive sort of experience, all other sorts appear to be transcended. Page 575. At first sight, it may appear that whatever difficulty may be felt arises from the fact that too sharp a separation is made by the critic between the cognitive experience and other experiences. Professor Dewey says, I should define a cognitive experience as one which has certain bearings or implications, which induce and fulfill themselves in a subsequent experience, in which the relevant thing is experienced as cognized, as a known object, and is thereby transformed or reorganized. Page 396. And this definition seems to take in all kinds of experiences so that no injustice can be charged with regard to a special class of experiences. Thus, in the illustration given by Professor Dewey, the first experience is a fearsome noise, which, by its own peculiar constitution, induces an investigation or inquiry, 
and so leads on to the experience labeled noise as a wind curtain fact. With regard to the latter, two things may be noted. A. Its character differs from that of the preceding experience only in the circumstance that it is more predominantly of the kind described by James as knowledge about or pointing, rather than of the kind known as direct acquaintance with. And b. It is a change of experienced reality affected through the medium of cognition. Page 395. Considered as true, it is superior to the prior experience because in it we find the fulfillment, the readjustment, the satisfaction of the preceding experience, which clamored for reform. Considered as real, both experiences are simply instances of present functioning, and so stand on the same level. This seems to dispose of the suggestion that the difference between the cognitive and the non-cognitive has been overlooked and that the transcendent nature of cognition has been treated with neglect. If all experiences are the same in kind, there need be no occasion to emphasize a difference of this sort. Nor is it obvious that the transcendent character of cognition does not receive due consideration. While there is doubtless a change of experienced reality affected through the medium of cognition, this does not preclude the possibility of satisfying the demand of the critic that in cognitive experience all other sorts of experience may exist without alteration. For other sorts, we must substitute other instances. The other instances exist within it, in the sense that they are continuous with it, and are the objects to which the experience in question refers or points. A difficulty can arise here, it would seem, only if we treat the former experiences as entities which are transferred bodily in order to be included as integral parts of the present experience. Yet the point urged by Professor Woodbridge cannot be set aside so easily. The explanation of the pragmatist gains whatever plausibility it may possess from the fact that the implications involved in the concept of an experience developing solely by inner motivation are not carried out to their logical conclusion. In a developing experience, the later stage, as we have seen, is to be described as predominantly of the pointing type, and this characteristic indicates that it is not a final stage. If the experience, beginning with the fearsome noise, were permitted to run its full course, the experience of noise as a wind curtain fact would turn out to be simply a stage in a process, the goal of which would be another experience of the type of acquaintance with, differing, however, from the initial stage, in the fact that it would be of this type, not merely predominantly, but completely or ideally. The complete truth of any experience, it seems, must be sought in this final stage. This final stage or term, however, cannot apparently be considered as cognitive in the sense of answering a question regarding the nature of any other experience, nor can it be termed cognitive as this term is defined by Professor Dewey. I cannot say this is what that means, for such affirmation implies pointing, and pointing is a characteristic that pertains solely to the stages which precede the final goal. The final stage, therefore, is neither true nor untrue, except for the onlooking psychologist. Though it be conceded that the progressive fulfillment of an experience brings out with increasing clearness the truth or meaning of the starting point, the last stage is a born whence no traveler returns, even in retrospect. And the nature of this final stage is necessarily a question of supreme interest and importance. I wish to repeat that the final stage is not one in which any questions are asked or answered. And as Professor Woodbridge contends, if this be true, it follows that no one sort of experience is identified or distinguished. And what sort of an experience would that be if not precisely what we should mean by an unconscious experience? Page 576. In a measure, this sudden transition from a world which is synonymous with experience to a world which is most startlingly realistic is anticipated or at least suggested by statements such as the following, quoted from Professor Dewey. The reader is begged to bear in mind that from this standpoint, when an experience or some sort of experience is referred to, some thing or some sort of thing is always meant. Page 394. If these final terms can be properly characterized as unconscious experience, then conscious experience is a phrase which must be confined to relations between such final terms. And it seems to follow at once that consciousness may be defined, therefore, as a kind of continuum of objects. Footnote. This journal, volume 2, number 5, page 121. End footnote. 
It may perhaps be objected that Professor Woodbridge passes too hastily from an experience in which no one sort of experience is identified or distinguished to the conclusion that such an experience or reality can be properly termed an unconscious experience. It takes too much for granted. The opponent may point out that identifying and distinguishing are lacking only in the sense which presupposes comparison with other experiences. Nevertheless, this inference that the final experience may properly be termed unconscious seems capable of sufficient justification. In other words, it appears that, as the doctrine is stated, the element of knowledge about or pointing is a constitutive and essential part of any experience of which we can form any respectable conception. While in the presentation of this doctrine, it is usually made to appear that the first and the last stages of the continuous development through which experience becomes differentiated both belong to the same general type of acquaintance with, there is a difference which seems essential. This difference has been indicated already by the statement that the first stage is only predominantly of this type, while the last is completely or ideally so. If the first stage were never complete in this sense, the inner motivation by which it leads on to further experience could not be present, for the complete stage is a cave where all tracks lead inward. It would be a sort of island in an ocean of pointing experiences. In the actual experience, the feature which we discriminate is the one which forms the point of departure, which prompts investigation and further observation. Such a feature is necessary in order that this particular bit of experience may form organic connections with other experiences. And if we attempt the task of trimming away, mentally, from this experience all such features as would lead beyond themselves, we seem in the end to have nothing left but a mass of undifferentiated material for which the epithet unconscious seems entirely appropriate. And since the first stage can be made self-sufficient only by trimming, it would appear that in the last stage also, such sufficiency can be attained only at the cost of all inner differentiation. That is to say, Pragmatism tacitly postulates an object of reference which lies beyond the experience of the individual. To this conclusion, it may perhaps be objected that the final stage or term is simply an abstraction or limiting term and not to be regarded as an experience anywhere realized or realizable. On the basis of this interpretation, however, it is difficult to see how solipsism is to be avoided. If we are to have a common world, there must be numerically identical points which are common to the different systems of experience, and such identical points can be provided only by these final terms. It appears, then, that the realistic conclusion follows from the premises laid down by the doctrine of pure experience. The distinction between the cognitive and the non-cognitive cannot be evaded. And from the utter disparity between the two, it seems necessary to conclude that consciousness and knowledge do actually disclose to us that which is in no way dependent on consciousness and knowledge for its existence or character. Knowledge is thus palpably realistic. Page 123. Is a realistic view of knowledge then our final hope? The acceptableness of this conclusion must depend in part upon the account which is given of the nature of those objects which knowledge is said to reveal. It seems that consciousness is, in a sense, an accidental feature of reality, since objects are not particularly affected by the circumstance of being known. It is claimed that even in a world like this, no limits can be set to knowledge. Page 122. But it is not clear that any increase in knowledge would even approximate to the inner unity by virtue of which things are what they are. Knowledge reveals to us a set of qualities and relations, but the thinghood of objects inevitably escapes us. Or shall we say that this demand is a return to scholastic essences and that whatever characteristics or attributes an object may possess are of the sort that are revealed to us in all knowing? This also involves implications which it is not easy to accept. What shall we say to such experiences as sweetness, contrast effects, and harmoniousness? They undoubtedly have a basis in fact. And what sort of a fact is it? To say that it is the same sort of fact as that which we know when we experience them is to me rather unintelligible. And if it is conceded to be a different sort of fact, we seem forced to fall back in the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, which is simply the entering wedge of idealism. Considerations of the sort here presented make it impossible for me to convince myself that the time has come to abandon the conception of selfhood as the ultimate category in metaphysics, 
or that of pure experience or of objects existing independently of consciousness. Professor Woodbridge rightly warns the pragmatists against the tendency to do violence to the character of transcendence pertaining to the cognitive experience. That this character is put in jeopardy by their procedure I am forced to believe. But in order to be just to this character, is it necessary or even defensible to postulate objects which are not dependent upon consciousness for their existence and their nature? Idealism, whatever its form, has difficulties in plenty. Yet, to my mind, it indicates the direction in which the solution of our problems is to be sought, if it is to be found at all. End of Cognitive Experience and Its Object by B. H. Boda.